The 1980s were an intense time for Audi. Developing their Quattro all-wheel drive system helped them secure two WRC titles during Rally's wild Group B era. But after Group B folded in 1986, Audi was left with plenty of expertise and tech, but nowhere to compete. At first, they tried their luck with Group A rallying, the Group B follow-up with safer regulations. Yet, the Audi 200 wasn't an ideal rally car. Audi then shifted their sights to road racing in North America, where they could fully showcase their capabilities. In 1988's Trans Am and 1989's IMSA entries, Audi's competitors were so intimidated that both championships altered their rules to limit Audi's dominance or even push them out. That story's been told many times before, so Audi looked back to their home base. The Deutsche Tourenwagen Meisterschaft, DTM, had been Germany's leading touring car series since 1984. But Audi, already one of Germany's biggest motorsport names, had been notably absent from this event, focusing more on rally and North American racing efforts. If their WRC, Trans Am, and IMSA track record was anything to go by, DTM's top teams were in for a surprise. However, DTM followed modified Group A rules, requiring race cars to closely resemble a production counterpart. With at least a few hundred units built, these rules were similar to those for Audi's Group A rally car, which had been underwhelming in the WRC. But in DTM, the rules varied enough to pose a new challenge. With turbos banned after 1989, Ford's Sierra RS500 was weakened, and Audi couldn't use their turbocharged 2.1L inline-five engine that had won them so much acclaim. Audi would need to rethink their approach to contend with BMW and Mercedes. Step one was to determine which of their production models could be transformed into a top touring car. This step was vital, as unlike Group B or IMSA, the race car would have to stay close to the chosen production model, including its engine. Race cars aim to be light, agile, powerful, and responsive. With this in mind, Audi, a highly seasoned motorsport brand decided to compete with the Audi V8, a large executive sedan. Introduced in 1988, the Audi V8 was Audi's flagship luxury car, akin to today's A8. Though the A8 is impressive, it wouldn't be an obvious choice for lap times. Still, turning luxury sedans into track-ready machines was something Audi had done well in North America. So maybe it wasn't as wild as it sounded. The V8 was essentially a larger and more advanced version of the Audi 80 and 100. But, as the name implied, it was powered by a naturally aspirated V8 engine. In a championship without turbos, this engine could be a game changer against their mostly four-cylinder rivals. The V8 from the road car was tuned up with its initial output just under 420 horsepower, a clear advantage over the 330 horsepower of BMW and Mercedes's four cylinders. But this power didn't translate to a clear edge as Audi's signature Quattro all-wheel drive system added roughly 200 kilograms. They managed to shed some weight, but not entirely. Audi bet that the four-wheel drive advantage would pay off, just as it had in North America. The car was ready for the 1990 DTM season. DTM weekends differ from other motorsport series, with each track hosting two 55-minute races, one on Saturday and one on Sunday each with its own qualifying session just hours before. Like the model later used in Super GT in the late 90s, DTM implemented on-the-fly weight penalties to keep racing competitive. The goal was to keep the action thrilling. Audi's entries were managed by Schmidt Motorsport, SMS, with drivers Hans Stuck, Walter Rural, and Frank Zielinski. Round one was held at Zolder, where SMS's car, driven by Stuck, was struck from behind, forcing him to pit early and compromising his race. He recovered to finish 14th, but it wasn't the debut they had hoped for, especially since only the top 10 drivers earned points. Fortunately, they had a second shot the following day. Race two went far better for Stuck, 
who scored a podium finish behind two AMG 190E Evo cars. The following events followed suit, with second place finishes and a Nürburgring weekend marred by an accident. Then, SMS found its rhythm. In round four, Stuck won both races at Avis, beating BMW twice in a row. Audi had arrived. Round five was a setback, but Stuck was back in form with wins at Wunsdorf. The rest of the season was a mixed bag. With weekends showing inconsistent results, Stuck won race one at the Norris Ring and race two on the Nürburgring GP circuit. For the final round, SMS eased pressure on Stuck by adding two more cars for Rural and Zielinski, who completed podium sweeps twice that weekend. This shut out BMW and Mercedes from the podiums entirely. Championship contender Johnny Sokoto, driving for BMW, saw his title hopes dashed in the final race after being spun by none other than Michael Schumacher, allowing SMS driver Hans Stuck, who'd driven solo with an unproven car most of the season, to clinch the championship title. It was a monumental win for Audi, who had become masters of shaking up the motorsport world. The sky was the limit. At some point in 1990, though it's unclear exactly when, Audi further tweaked the engine, bumping its power from just under 420 to around 460 horsepower. If that weren't enough, they used Evo rules. Adding a splitter and ducktail spoiler for extra downforce, the added power and aerodynamic tweaks meant Audi came into the following season with nearly 10% more power. BMW and Mercedes barely modified their cars after 1990. In addition, SMS wasn't the only team racing the V8 Quattro, as Audi Zentrum, AZR, joined, with drivers Frank Biela and Hubert Haupt. SMS retained champion Hans Stuck and Frank Jelinski. The season opener saw BMW dominate, with Sokoto winning both races at Zolder, while Audi managed a second and third in the second race. The next round played out similarly, until Avis, where they claimed the top four spots in race one, led by Stuck, before a top three finish in race two, with AZR driver Frank Biela taking first. Only a fire in AZR's second car prevented a second four-way podium sweep. After this dominant performance, Audi struggled at Wunsdorf, but Stuck won again at Norris Ring in race two. These fluctuations in Audi's performance led to sandbagging rumors, suggesting they played a longer game, managing weight penalties, and racing as a team. They seemed to have the ideal car for winning when it mattered, although motorsport is never an exact science. Stuck won race one at Diepholz, and again in race two at Singen, where race one had been won by Biela, who then showcased the V8's potential with dominant wins in the last two races at Diepholz. If the sandbagging theory sounds outlandish, know that both races saw Audi emerge from mid-pack to take full podium sweeps. Regardless, Audi played DTM to perfection, securing a second straight championship for AZR's Frank Biela. Audi arrived in 1992 with a similar car, now with around 470 horsepower, but a different sound. However, the season started poorly for Audi. Biela scored a podium in the first race, but in race two, all four Audis retired with mechanical issues, three being engine related. What had Audi been up to? They rebounded in round two at Nürburgring, with Biela taking victory, closely followed by Stuck and Jelinski in a wet race one. However, all Audis fell down the order during a dry race two, as four-wheel drive was far more advantageous in low-grip conditions. In Wunsdorf's next round, things began to unravel. Defending champion Frank Biela was disqualified from race two for using an illegal crankshaft. The previous year's V8, and crucially the production model, used a 90-degree cross-plane crankshaft. Biela's car used a 180-degree flat-plane crank, which was considered too different from the homologated spec. The team continued a few more rounds, presumably reverting to the original engine, but they withdrew midway through the season. Audi felt the decision was unfair. For all their successes, Audi was known to be a sore loser. 
By now, the V8 Quattro was 350 kilograms heavier than its rivals in 1992, and their advantage had clearly dwindled. Audi's DTM journey was intense, but brief. When they lost ground, they pulled out just as swiftly as they'd entered. With the V8 Quattro gone, Mercedes took the opportunity to rise to prominence just before DTM entered a new era. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the like button and see you next time.